So this was a really interesting thing. Just yesterday, I was working on this lecture and I got a notification from LinkedIn that somebody was asking for a copy of these notes in the UK. So they had seen the talk on YouTube and they were searching for ion mobility mass spectrometry and I couldn't find any information on it. And my lecture popped up. And so I was like, wow, what a coincidence. <laughs> so anyway, that was, that was just really funny to, to sort of get that request right as I'm working on those set of notes. Just the coincidences sometimes just baffle your mind. And so what are we talking about today? Well, this is sort of a, I would say, I don't know. I don't know if the right. I mean, the educational term is enrichment, right? We've we've talked about instrumental analysis. We've talked about uh, explosives and narcotics, and and this is a little bit of an extension of the forensic degree that you're getting, and and most of the forensic analysis that we're talking about would be in the lab situation where there's been a crime committed or alleged, and evidence is collected. It comes into the lab. And you're working sort of in the the forum, right? That's the forensic route, the forum. You're working in the legal system to determine guilt or innocence. In a terroristic situation, we don't want to wait until afterwards. So the same skills that you have for understanding evidence after an event can be used to detect or disrupt or deter uh, an occurrence before it occurs. And so that may be an option for some of you if you're if you're you know talented and and have the right like coincidental contacts and so on and the opportunities arise your same skills may be useful on the front end of things for um, detecting the intent or capability of folks that are planning things. So this is this is what this is related to sort of your skills applied to security operations and detecting before the event occurs. And so this is a little bit of a different take on, on forensics. So the role of, of security operations is the three Ds. Detect threats and threatening events and the supporting infrastructure, disrupting those events or infrastructure, and then destroying the threats or, or infrastructure. So we need to talk about what a threat is. And uh, the secondary goal is have a minimal impact on, on normal life. Like we can, like we did with the uh, lockdowns, that was a, a, a large impact on normal life. And so we were trying to disrupt or, um, or destroy the supporting infrastructure of a pandemic would be person to person transmission. And so we were trying to disrupt or destroy that, that vector or, or ability to transmit the disease, but it was maximally impactful <laughs> on normal life. So um, yeah, so that's what we mean by impact, minimal impact on normal life. So what is a threat? Well, this is a threat has two po two components to it. There's intent and there's capability. So, uh, you know, there's, you know, intent to cause harm to you, or your neighbors, business, city, state, country. The, the largest target would be um, the the thing that you would have the least capacity to uh, to be successful, right? So. Uh, Intent can be everywhere. I mean, you've got personal enemies, ex-friends, right? competitors, disgruntled employees, other governments, uh, international terrorists. So there's lots of intent out there. And so it really needs to be both. It needs to be not just intent, but also capability. So what do we mean by the capabilities? Well, the capability to cause harm. There's a ton of capabilities that can ha cause harm to a single person. And I mean, it's just... Um, really difficult to eliminate all possibilities of, of harm. But we're really talking about, you know, harm to large groups. And so there's fewer capabilities to harm large groups. So uh, over in our security studies area of our university, they keep a sort of a database of extreme groups. So they know there's lots of extreme groups out there that have intent. And so that that raises it to level to look and see, do they have the capabilities? You know, does this person have the contacts or, or the drive or the um, resources to enact their intent to cause harm? So those are the, the two pieces of, of a threat that we look at. What makes an attractive target? Well, you, if you want to cause substantial harm, you need a large number of victims, a confined space, to minimize escape, 
a controlled and predictable environment, and a highly symbolic target. Okay. Um, why was the World Trade Center targeted? I mean, that's not a military thing. It's not, you know, it's not um, related to our government in any way, really. I mean, maybe there were some contractors in there, but it was for its symbolic value. You know, this was the, like the pride of New York, and you know, it really it did have a huge um, symbolic impact. Now they did attack the Pentagon too. That was a military target, and there was some uh, speculation that the plane that went down in Pennsylvania was aimed was aiming either at um, Capitol Hill or at the White House. So, um, so those would be more a direct hit on a government facility. And then soft security, right? Low or easily defeated. Um, I mean, no one at that time saw the. The, you know, the concept really as being realistic of flying a plane into buildings, although you could look back and say that there was some some hints at that. Uh, but the largest hint I saw was in the Clancy book, um, Patriot Games. And so at the end of Patriot Games, the the um, the father of someone who was killed in in the, the war that was in that book um, decided to take his own life and he flew his uh his like 747 airplane into the Capitol uh, during kind of like the State of the Union address. It was during an address to the, both chambers of Congress and knocked out pretty much all of the heads of government. And that's how Jack Ryan, spoiler alert, becomes president. Okay. <laughs> so, it's a great book. I mean, it's, and then he's now president. And the very next book is uh, about an Ebola outbreak, a terrorist attack with Ebola. So it was a terrifying pair of books. I'm trying to remember. Executive Orders was the was the next book. And so here we have in, John, in Tom Clancy's books, decade before 9-11, talking about flying a plane into into a building and then talking about what how America would respond to a pandemic. You know, so it's really, the guy is amazing. That's why I like his, his books. So this describes sporting events, business buildings, all kinds of things that you're familiar with. And that's why we have so much security at these at these different places. You know, it was really worrisome right after 9-11 to have in New York City the, the big gathering for uh, New Year's Eve, you know, the Times Square. I mean, that is symbolic, a lot of people. Uh, it's chaotic, hard to, hard to have security. So I was really amazed at how well New York planned for having a good New Year's Eve celebration. They didn't just let people flood into Times Square anymore. But they still wanted a lot of people in Times Square, so they made, made they basically sold tickets to these little boxes. So they put up little squares of barricades, and you bought tickets for your little barricade box. And so there'd be ten or so of you in that little barricaded box, and so the crowd couldn't crush either way. Um, and they said it was actually more enjoyable than it was in the past because people had gone before, and it was just elbow to elbow and felt really dangerous and and scary because you feel totally cramped. And and so they actually made it much more secure. They had, of course, screening on the way in, check your bags and stuff like that. So let's talk about the chemistry of it. Uh, some of the um, chemical agents, so one of the possibilities would be a chemical agent attack. Um, you guys have the skills and knowledge of the different chemical uh, nomenclature and things. Well, here's some of the, the bad actors in terms of chemical warfare agents. A lot of the most potent ones are organophosphate nerve agents. And so what these do is irreversibly inactivate choline, uh, acetylcholine esterase. Now, this is stretching the limits of my biochemical knowledge, but maybe y'all have talked about this um, in your class. But, but the way your nerves work is they, they send out an, a neurotransmitter and cause the muscles to, to act. And then this acetylcholine esterase turns the signal off. So this is the off signal. So your body turns on the signal, your central nervous system tells the muscles to do something, and then they need this acetylcholine esterase to turn the signal off. And these organophosphate nerve agents inactivate the turn off signal. And so you basically, your muscles contract and twitch you to death. You cannot breathe anymore, you, you know, and it gets to all of your nervous systems. And so it's a disastrous way to die. I mean, it, it's really bad. And they're incredibly potent. You know, just a, a little drop will be enough. I don't remember, I've looked up the lethal dose, but it's really small. 
I can't remember the, the specific um, amount, but uh, sarin is the one that scared me the most when I looked it up, uh, but they're all bad. Okay, And then these, you know, even though it sounds awful to die by organophosphate nerve agents, I almost would, I don't know, it's kind of a morbid even think about it, I almost would prefer that to the mustard gases. These these um, react with your skin and just just destroy your skin. They blister it all up. Now, all these were really used. The mustards, especially, were used in World War One, and World War One really did shock the conscience of the world. They they saw the the gas warfare, and the world was like, we don't want to go down that road again. We had built a whole chemical weapons arsenal on our country, all the other major countries involved in World War One. We had all of those artillery shells ready to go and didn't use any of them in World War II. That's pretty crazy if you think about it, to have be fighting the Second World War, have all of these chemical agents, and nobody wanted to cross that threshold. That's how scary and nasty they were. So anyway, that's... And so these nitrogen mustards, these are... Um, you know, what is this word, lewisite? Well, they, these are Lewis bases. So they're these, uh, you know, caustic amines and, and sulfur mustard gases. Uh, what What's interesting about them is people have survived these attacks and their skin will regrow and so on. But the real problem is to fight secondary infection. Like if you lose that protective layer of your body, then uh, it's really susceptible to bacterial infection. And a lot of times it's a secondary infection that people die from in the mustards. These are very volatile. And so that makes them difficult to hide. So in terms of your abilities as a forensic chemist, as an instrumental analysis person, you would know that if you, would, if you were going to put anything in a subway that would detect possible warfare agents or, or you know, attack agents, the, the volatility of these substances would give it away. Somebody comes in with a with a camelback, uh, you know, in their backpack with, filled with something like this, these, these molecules are gonna permeate through that plastic and that backpack is gonna stink like these. Now you wouldn't smell it with your nose, but a really sensitive gas phase detector would smell them. So that we do have tools for, for collecting uh, this evidence and, and detecting them. Then there's toxic industrial chemicals. Now, much easier to obtain. Now, yeah, the mustards and the organophosphate nerve agents, these are going to be really difficult to get. And so that works also in our uh, ability to prevent these from being used, is that they're just very difficult to get. Um, there would be dangerous to make. You would have to really contain them in terms of uh, having really good negative pressure hoods and so on, so you don't poison yourself. So. Uh, toxic industrial chemicals would be much easier to obtain. You know, farmers use large tanks of ammonia to, to fertilize their fields. And, and, you know, if you've got a thousand acre farm and you've got this tank out there, you're not going to, maybe nowadays they might put cameras on it, but a lot of times these things are left unattended for large, large stretches of time. So you can pull up that, bust the lock and, and get a lot of ammonia out of these tanks. But, in terms of uh, using it, you need a lot of it to cause a lot of damage. Pool facilities use large tanks of chlorine. You know, if you have a residential pool, you have chlorine tablets probably. But at larger pools, they have tanks of chlorine gas that they inject into the solution, into the water uh, at a slow rate, and it chlorinates the water. So, you know, again, people could bust the lock and abscond with a pressurized tank full of chlorine gas. But these are not so toxic to kill at low doses. And so if you wanted to actually cause a huge, um, you know, have an impact, a huge impact, you would need a large amount. And the large amount is hard to conceal. So this kind of toxic industrial chemical attack is possible, but you'd need a large amount to, to create a large impact. And so it's too conspicuous for mass transit and, uh, and you need a large amount for a toxic dose. And they're volatile. If, you, if I'm going to try to um, expose all of you to a substance, it needs to be volatile to get to you quickly. You know, if I have it in this bottle and I open the lid and nothing happens because it stays a liquid, then, you know, y'all aren't exposed and you can get out. 
Uh, one way to disperse a liquid to make it spread is with an explosive, but you don't want the explosive to burn a substance. And so how are you going to disperse it without destroying it? So these are all difficult problems. Thank God. <laughs> right. So you're walking through, you're like, how are we going to stop this? Well, nature itself makes it difficult. And so then when you see somebody trying to overcome some of these um, these uh, natural impediments, it looks suspicious. You have paraphernalia, you have precursors. If you're making nerve agent, you're going to have precursors. And you're like, this is weird. This isn't a meth lab. What is this? You know, and and she do your research and like, oh, my gosh, these are the precursors for sarin nerve gas. We've got a different kind of situation on our hand. This isn't a meth head. This is somebody planning a bigger, bigger attack. Um, ex explosives, you know, that that can have a huge impact, even a small explosive. So I realize this is a long time ago, but it was one of the uh, most um, well investigated uh, airline disaster. So on J December 21st in 1988, so I had just graduated high school. <laughs> so first year in college, um, this uh, 450 grams, so basically one pound of plastic explosive brought down uh, a Pan Am flight and killed uh, 243 passengers, 16 crew, and 11 people on the ground in Lockerbie, Scotland. So it you know hit a bunch of houses and everything tragic event. Um, so the plane's debris was spread all over the place. And so they, they got a big hangar. They retrieved all the bits. They basically rebuilt the plane by setting the bits next to each other and tried to investigate where the explosion took place. So they retrieved more than 10,000 pieces of, of debris. And they found a part of the fuselage that had a 20-inch had a hole in the forward cargo hold. So that's not that big, if you think about it, 20 inches, um, you know, here's 12, 12 inches. So, you know, it's about that big. So a hole that big brought down the whole plane. And then they examined the baggage and they, they found some bags that contained high energy damage and they tested the, um, uh, they did test explosions, okay. And so they, they said, well, if it was one pound, it was the right size, you know, smaller or bigger was not the right size. So they, they did test explosions and then they found uh, fragments of a, the Samsonite suitcase that uh, contained the bomb and pieces of the circuit board were identified as a Toshiba uh, cassette player. So like a little Walkman cassette player. That's how big the bomb was. Does that scare you when you fly? I mean, Something that small could bring the whole plane down. And that was what in 88, I mean, we were shocked because we're like, really? It doesn't require a bomb the size of a suitcase, but a cassette player in a, in a, in a suitcase could bring the, bomb, bring the plane down. And now you see why airline security has really been beefed up to try to, try to find that kind of stuff. Of course, the circuit board uh, fragment then was traced down and they found that it was a, a, a timer um, and it was traced to the Libyan uh, military. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. So they were even able to track this bag from airport to airport through the baggage tracking system. So it's an amazing investigation. Uh, and this is, um, was an unaccompanied bag that was just routed through. So the, the bad guy wasn't even on the plane. So these are forensic indicators of a threat. Volatile compounds such as chemical warfare agents or toxic industrial chemicals are gonna indicate a threat and they must be detected by these gas phase detection techniques. Explosives also indicate a threat. And so we've talked about what the explosives are in the last lecture. We, um, we talked about their volatility. Um, they're not necessarily, not necessarily dangerous to handle like uh, Chemical warfare agents and, and toxic industrial chemicals are tricky to handle, but explosives are, are just organic molecules. They're, they're not dangerous in many cases, especially if they're, if they're handled wet. So if you have uh, the, the molecule in a solvent or whatever, it's not a detonation risk. So you can work with it just like any other organic substance. Okay, and, and so they must be safe in order to be handled in order to also be used 
So this is the sensitivity scale for these different uh, explosives. And I wanted to put a little bit new information in, in, uh, in this talk. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth about this sensitivity scale. So the lead stiffnate, mercury fulminate, those primary explosives, those are very sensitive to shock. And so you don't want to, um, you don't want to, uh, you know, bang them or have anything hit them or drop them. Uh, and then the secondary explosives, you know, nitroglycerin is extremely sensitive. Look at that, 0.2. And you, they even played on this uh, back in the day when they were using it for mining. And you can watch the old 1960s or 70s movie of uh, uh, John Wayne and Catherine Hepburn. I mean, if you want to have an old-timey movie night, look up Rooster Cogburn. He's, that's John Wayne's character's name. And they uh, have a, a wagon filled with nitroglycerin um, in the in like come apart in this river, and he's shooting the boxes of nitroglycerin and they're blowing up. You know, so like even in the seventies in the Hollywood movie, they knew oh nitroglycerin is shock sensitive, and and so as as a little kid, I remember thinking wow nitroglycerin is so shock sensitive, and Hollywood was right on that. Okay. Uh, Secondary explosives are less sensitive to detonation by dropping or static charge or friction. A friction's a big deal, uh, especially if you're going to machine that explosive. If you're going to have a plastic explosive that you're going to put into a particular device um, and you need to drill a hole in it, you that's friction, right? You're drilling a hole into the substance uh, and, you know, what at what speed does the drill bit go before it blows up? You know, and so at, at Pantex, they actually had a high speed drilling facility with the roof that opened up and remotely controlled machines. And so you could put an explosive in there with a particular formulation and have the drill bit go faster and faster and faster. And finally, the thing would go, pow, you know, they're like, OK, don't go that fast. <laughs> and they could set their parameters and they could drill and machine and cut the explosives. And so that's. You know, there's a lot of explosive uses in like oil and gas and mining. Pardon? Yeah, Newton's uh, Newton meters. And so that would be sort of an energy input. So, um, and we'll see how they get that in, in a second. Yeah. And so this drop hammer test is used to rank sensitivity. So this is new. It's not in your notes, but this is the drop hammer test apparatus. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm sure this paper was available a few years ago when I made these notes, but I, I don't remember finding it. And so yesterday I searched for the drop hammer test apparatus and, and lo and behold, the paper was there and I pulled down the PDF. And so this is uh, a really cool apparatus. Of course, it's all remotely controlled and everything because you don't want it, you know, exploding and, and hurting you. Although you only put a small amount of explosive in it, but it's still, it's safe to be in the other room. So this is the apparatus as a whole, and, and this is the weight. And so they lift this weight up a certain distance and then let go of it, and it slams down on this little anvil. And so inside that anvil is a bunch of steel, sort of a steel box, and you've got a couple of stainless steel pieces that pinch together and you put your explosive in that gap and you drop the hammer and you, you lift it up a few centimeters and drop it and nothing happens. You lift it up a little bit more and drop it, nothing happens. Eventually you lift it up high enough that the explosive goes off. It puts enough energy. And again, you know the mass and you know gravity. So that's the Newtons and how high you lift it is the meters. So Newtons times the distance is gonna be the, the Newton meter impact sensitivity. Now, how do you know if it went off or not? Well, you, you take the explosives out and you drop this and you record the signal. So there's a microphone and that's what this little guy is. That's a microphone. So how, why, why is a microphone good? Well, remember explosive is gonna turn to gas, you know, it's gonna react the oxygen and fuel are right there in the molecule and it makes gasish products. And so there's a huge pulse pressure and what is our, what is sound? It's a pressure wave. You know, my vocal cords are shaking the air and your ears picking up those pressure wave 
fluctuation. So a microphone is a perfect detector to see if this produced a large pressure wave. Now, this metal slamming together is going to produce a pressure wave, but it's much smaller. And so you, you listen to just the blank, pop, 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 you know, and then you put the explosive in there, small distance, pop. Sounds no different than, than just the metal on metal. But then you reach a certain distance where it really bangs, like pow, you know, okay, we have a, we have a detonation. So that's the drop hammer test. And you can rank all of those explosives by their sensitivities. And that's where these numbers come from. And so the, you know, the TATB and the ammonium nitrate, those are really high in terms of their drop hammer. They're very insensitive. So ammonium nitrate is not a problem to work with, but if you get enough of it and you get it hot and it starts to decompose, then it can detonate. And so a few years back, uh, the fertilizer plant in West Texas exploded. They had a fire and there was a lot of ammonium nitrate there and it started to decompose and it ran away and then it detonated and leveled the, the plant and blew like most of the side of the high school out. I mean, the people were evacuated, but it destroyed the high school, uh, an apartment building, destroyed a lot. And uh, my, my cousin's son probably graduated because of that, because he wasn't doing so well, she says. And sure enough, it ruined all the records. <laughs> whole, anyway, it's a great story. She was like, yeah, boy, he, he, he dodged a bullet on that one. So anyway, it's kind of funny. I won't give names. <laughs> so users of explosives would, would like to use only insensitive explosives, but these can't be detonated independently. So if it's so insensitive, you can hit it with a little exploding bridge wire and nothing will happen. And so you need to have an explosive train. We kind of hinted at that last time. You have an initiation event, some impact, stab, electrical current, or heat. And then there's a sensitive explosive that burns and then deflagrates, so it gets more vigorous. And then it starts to send that shock wave through the material and we get a detonation. So then that primary charge detonates and then that goes into sometimes there's a booster and a secondary main charge or just a secondary main charge. That's uh, that should be insensitive explosives for safety reasons. Uh, but that's where you have the large charge. So even on like a military explosive, you have a, a like a demolition charge, you got a block of C4, you stick it to the wall, you want to knock this wall down, you still have to put a detonator in. And so as long as you keep the detonator separate from the main charge, a detonator will take your hand off, but it won't knock the wall down, it won't blow up the whole Jeep. But you stick it into the block of plastic explosives, now you have your explosive train put together. You have initiation, uh, detonation in the detonator, and then that explosive shockwave goes into the main charge and blows it up. Now. A lot of these insensitive explosives are not volatile. And so the sensitive ones are the volatile ones in almost every case. So the volatile components are right there. And in fact, uh, and maybe some, some byproducts or, or, or trace, out, trace volatile elements are in the main charge. Trace molecules. Like DNT. You've heard of TNT, that's trinitrotoluene. Dinitrotoluene is more volatile. And so if you have a large TNT charge, you may not detect the TNT signal, but you may detect the dinitrotoluene. And then the primary explosive that we typically detect is gonna be something like a PETN. So these are the, the, the big indicators. That would be uh, impurity in TNT. And then the detonator would have a tiny little bit of PETN, which again, there's not much there. And so you may not detect the PETN. It's more volatile than the main charge. But the main charge, if you have a, you know, a pound of TNT, you've got 200 parts per million of that is DNT, and you're going to be able to detect that, perhaps. Okay. Now, explosives... Again, those, that's sniffing. If we're sniffing for explosives, those are the things we would sniff. Um, sometimes we just need to detect if there's something suspicious and then we do uh, a more investigation. So imaging techniques like x-ray and terahertz 
can detect the density characteristics of main charges and the initiation circuitry uh, like wires and batteries and stuff like that. I always worry when I pack my backpack or my, my suitcase and I have all my clothes in there and all those hangers, you know, you all these wire-like things, but they have a, a definable shape. Like you look in there and you're like, okay, there's a lot of wires, but it looks like a hanger, you know, so they haven't really, that I know of, had my bags pulled off to the side. But sometimes you get your luggage at the hotel and you open it up and there's a little piece of paper and it says your bag was opened by the TSA. You know, something in there with the x-ray went through and they were like, mm, let's have a look, you know, and they open it up and, and they see, you know, you had extra batteries and you had some hangers and maybe your charging cables all coiled up and, and a little brick charger or something. And they're like, hmm, this looks odd enough. Let's take a, let's open the bag and take a look. Um, this is for screening and uh, you know you know in the in the security line and it really just flags people for um, further inspection so what's being shown here <clears throat> is kind of a stylized version of the terahertz um, terahertz imaging so this terahertz imaging is seeing this person has something behind their clothing that they're concealing because terahertz will reflect <clears throat> from water. So it's, uh, if you look at the you know, electromagnetic spectrum, you have, uh, let's see. So you have in the infrared, you know, the gigahertz, this is uh, above that. So it's um, in the terahertz region <clears throat> and it'll reflect off of water. So your body is just a, for this particular technique, a big bag of water. So it's gonna go through your clothing and bounce off the water and come back out. So all you're looking for is missing light. So the light goes through your clothing, bounces off your body, and there's a dark spot here. That dark spot is something dense, something between the, the source and the detector that absorbed the terahertz uh, material. So they're gonna pull this person aside they're going to say, I told you to empty your pockets and everything. And, you know, you know, if it's under their shirt, of course, they're going to pull them into a private room or space, say, lift your shirt. I want to see what's around your waist belt or waistband. Um, they detected a, a cough drop in my pocket. And the guy's yelling, you know, empty your pockets and everything. And they go through the security line. And I, I had my, um, my phone and my ID in my hand. I stand there like that. And the little deal goes, Zzz, and, and the guy, I step out and he goes, I told you to empty your pockets. And I was like, I did. And he goes, something's in your right pocket. And I said, okay. And I said, I'm going to get it out. So I reach in and I pull it out as a cough drop, you know? And he was like, I told you. I said, okay, all right. You know, I missed it. All right. It was a cough drop. But, you know, that they detected that tiny little cough drop. Is he going to bring down a plane? I don't know. But I'm glad that, you know, he was like, hey, you got something in your pocket. You know, respect my authority. You know? So, yeah. So another way to detect explosives is dogs. And, and again, they can smell these things. Whatever, they can smell whatever they're trained to smell and respond to. And this one really saved my day. Uh, I had a conference in Orlando and I'm flying back and I'm about an hour from my plane, but there's probably two and a half hours of line in front of me. <laughs> the security thing, the lines were just, I'd never seen that many people trying to go through the security line. And I thought, what are we going to do? There's no way I'm going to get to my flight. And I mean, I think everybody was in that situation. So they opened up one of the lines and they, like, so like the sea of people, they set up the ropes to go around security and they put a dog in the corner and they had everybody go slowly by the dog. And they said, we're going to, we're going to run you by the dog, just walk, at a normal pace, match the person in front of you. Don't get too close together. Don't mess with the dog. Don't say anything to the dog. Don't pet the dog. Just walk by the dog. Okay. And so you had your carry on and, and you walk by the dog and the dog's just sitting there and sniffing and, and, and they screened everybody that way. So that if you had a charge or explosive in your bag, the dog would, would clue in on it. They also have money dogs. So there's dogs that are trained to smell currency. So to combat the, the drug trade, you're not allowed to fly with uh, over 10,000 in cash. So I don't know if you knew that, 
Yeah. So if you're carrying a bag full of cash, they're going to want to ask you questions. Why, why are you carrying $50,000 in cash in your, in your carry on? So, you know, and then of course, drug dogs too, but this, these dogs were, um, trained. I'm, I'm assuming they were trained to screen for explosives because narcotics isn't going to bring the plane down and neither is cash. Okay. <clears throat> now you could use instrumentation to sniff for explosives like GCMS and, and multi-pass IR. And we'll look at, at these in a second. So, so here's the different vapor detection techniques. I use this one in my research in, in graduate school, tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy. And it's extremely sensitive, so it can detect really low amounts of the volatile substance. And it's extremely selective because it's really high resolution. So I could tell the difference between small molecules and, and, and things that would have a very similar absorption spectrum I could, I could detect and select but it's, it was like one of a kind instrumentation. It's expensive because it's not commercialized yet. Then we have uh, GCMS. This of course is the gold standard and what you will use in the lab to analyze evidence after the fact, but it's not good for screening. You know, you're gonna have people wait in line for 15 minutes while they run their little auto sampler, you know, evidence tray. Um, and so that's, it's not gonna work because it's too slow. Uh, long path IR, is selective, but not very sensitive. So they increase the path length and try to increase the sensitivity by having a path length. Remember, absorption is directly proportional to the absorption coefficient, the path length, and the concentration. So if your concentration is low, then you gotta increase the path length. Well, this might be good for a whole facility. Like you might have an infrared laser going back and forth through this room and have like a hundred meter path length. And it would detect if there's explosives in this room very easily, but it wouldn't be able to tell who has it. But that might be cool. You know, if you're in the, in the subway system and you have this thing going on, they, they detect a pathogen, not a pathogen, uh, uh, you know, a, a toxic chemical or warfare agent or whatever, they can lock down that tunnel and start investigating. Now that's gonna be disruptive, but it, if it's a sarin nerve gas, Maybe we want to stop this, shut the doors, and, and figure out where it is. A terahertz spectroscopy. I say it's still in its infancy because we're really not using it in the airports to detect the, the substance ID, right? Like on that person, you could see through her shirt that she had some dense object on her body, but we weren't able to get any information about the, the substance. So it's really a screening technique that says, hey, pull them aside and, and look to see what they're doing. Of course, dogs are good, but they, they can't really be mass produced, you know, not like in a factory. And it's expensive to train them on the different to topics or different substances. <clears throat> now they have electronic noses. Maybe you've, has anybody heard of an electronic nose? <clears throat> this is a weird combination. This is really neat from, from a chemistry point of view. They have atomic force microscopy, which has uh, <clears throat> like an atomically sharp needle that can probe the surface and they can control the, the um, position of this needle really well with, it's really like a nano device. Well, they can connect that needle and have really sensitive uh, detection of the forces on this needle, they can put polymers between that needle and, and, a, and another substance. And what you can do is you can mix, say, an explosive in with this polymer. And so the polymer has the explosive in it. You make the device, then you heat the device up really hot, and the explosive leaves. So there's like a hand in glove hole where that explosive was or that chemical agent was. And now that needle will smell that explosive. When the explosive is in the polymer, it's gonna have a flexibility of one type. When the explosive is out, it's gonna have a different flexibility. So they can make those sort of olfactory sensors for every kind of substance. So it's incredibly sensitive, but, it's, but it, in terms of a wide range of detection, you have to make a, a fiber for every molecule that you want to detect. So you can imagine that that would be very 
expensive to do, but if you could mass produce it, you could make a very sensitive electronic nose that's just out there sniffing all the time. And if that molecule comes in, it gets stuck in the polymer that it's perfect for. And then, then that, that particular signal um, you know, rings the bell. <clears throat> so the range of detection is really expensive. And then we have ion mobility spectrometry. We, we talked about this in the instruments section. We'll talk about it again today. It has that benefit of mass spectrometry and chromatography crammed together. Uh, it was developed by the Army to detect chemical weapons. They have belt-sized versions of this, so it's been miniaturized. And, and the Coast Guard used it to detect narcotics, and it's used in airports worldwide. So we see these little box boxes at the airports, and this is what's going on inside. And we use it with a wipe. So you, this is the chemical warfare agent, the belt-sized one. They can, they can wear on a backpack or something like that. So it's very sensitive. It'll sniff the, the toxic chemicals at a level below the physiological effect level. So when this thing goes ding, everybody grabs their chemical suits and put them on. So it's a chance to give them a heads up that there's a chemical smell in the area. Let's put on our chemically protective equipment. So it's definitely able to save lives in that manner. For the airports, we wipe down the baggages or the shoes and so on, and that, that sample wipe goes in to this desorber. So there's also, not really shown on here, but a calibration gas. So there's a little liquid in here that, that has molecules that come up here, and the calibration gas is um, C, Cl2H2, so dichloromethane. It's an inexpensive compound. <coughs> It's easily ionized with those chlorines. So it gets in here and there's nickel 63 that, that is radioactive. And so it sends beta particles into this little region. That, the reason we're using a radioactive source is because to get an electron beam um, out of an electronic wire, you need a really high voltage. And so we, you know, for electron ionization and the mass spec, <clears throat> you have a high voltage wire and it's just streaming electrons. Your molecules come out of the chromatograph, they get hit by the electrons, they ionize, they go through the mass spec. We wanna do the same thing here, but we don't want the high voltage power supply. So they just make an, a beta emitter, a nickel 63 source that's giving us beta particles. They ionize the calibration gas. The calibration gas is always giving us a signal until another molecule comes in. And when another molecule comes in, it actually reacts with the calibration gas, steals the electron, and then it becomes ionized. And so when it's ionized, it flows down this channel against air, and it's attracted to the, the collector or the detector and gives a signal. <clears throat> so this grid plate pulses, the ions down the drift tube through a counterflow of air, um, narcotics typically form positive ions, and so the detector needs to be negative for narcotics, and they'll go down and they'll hit. Uh, but if you're looking for narcotics, you're blind to explosives. And, in, and the explosives form negative ions, and so you make the, the detector positive, so the explosives go down and hit the detector, but then you're blind to narcotics. We really would like to detect both at airports, and so they make a dual tube. So now it's like a T. So you put in the white, it goes up, they're ionized, we have a positive detector on this end, a negative detector on this end, and the narcotics and the, de the explosives go to their respective detectors and we can detect both. So those are the sort of second or third generation equipment. So here's the calibration gas, that dichloromethane. It, it drifts down the tube and, and hits, um, hits the detector and then when you have another substance in it, notice how the, the calibration gas disappears. So this first trace in the plasmagram waterfall plot is the calibration gas, and then this other substance grows in. It steals all of the electrons from the calibration gas, and it's now ionized and is detected. So we have all of these, these uh, criteria that we can use to determine if this is a substance of interest, a chemical warfare agent, a toxic industrial chemical, an explosive, a narcotic. We have the max amplitude, the width of the peak, the number of segments it's in, and then this integrated area of the total amplitude. So we can put all of these into a little data file inside the instrument, and you can see all of these things. We have 
the drift time, which is this K0 number. So if the substance hits the detector and matches the drift time, which is like for a dinitrotoluene, DNT, you know, one and a half milliseconds, plus or minus 35 milliseconds, um, or, or probably some decimal place. It's, um, and then there's a, a block threshold and an amplitude threshold and a full width at half maximum threshold. And so if it matches all of these things, you know, then you've checked all your boxes and you know that that's dinitrotoluene. It's not as good as the M over Z fragment pattern with the isotopes and everything like that, but it's good enough to investigate. So it rings the bell, you pull the bag aside, you start looking. Uh, the criteria for, in, for the uh, TSA is to have every passenger go through in six seconds. So this has to make a judgment in six seconds, whether you pull that bag aside or let them go. That's pretty difficult criteria for chemical detection. Now we've other threats and capabilities now that we know about pandemics and so on, you know, it's, we say it's difficult to make some of these really complicated chemical weapons. It's also very difficult to make a virus that is transmissible, that is deadly. It's not too deadly, but just right deadly. And if you've ever played that game Plague Inc., I don't know if it's an older game. It really was pretty accurate in terms of how the virus needs to mutate. And if it's too more, you know, if it's too deadly, it doesn't spread. It's not deadly enough. It doesn't do any damage. And so it's really kind of a morbid game. You're trying to figure out how to make a superbug that will kill everybody on the planet, right? Well, who made this game? I don't know. But, but it's it's very instructive. New York Times wrote an article that says when gaming fantasy is really close to reality, you know, and and so Thomas and I would you know during pa during the pandemic we're all home. He's home from UT. The schools are closed. We're sitting around. And he told me about this game, and so we downloaded. It and we're like, man, let's see, let's how you know. It's amazing. Like anyway, it's an interesting game. I'll just say that. Um, you know, I'm I'm so happy that it's hard to make a super bug. Right. And, and that's been protecting us for centuries. You know, um, it's hard for nature to do it. It's hard for mankind to do it. Uh, but some of this work, I mean, it's uh, like the gain of function research and so on. I mean, it's it's a, it's hard to make a super bug, but we have the ability to do it. And so that's the scary part. Um, this work is done typically in biosafety labs. Um, there's different biosafety levels, and I realize this isn't in your notes, but this is added today. I just wanted to point this out to, to show some of the safety criteria that they have in a biosafety level four lab. So, you know, this would be something like the Ebola virus or, or some of these experimental viruses. And they, they you know, again, life-threatening diseases, uh, exotic agents, and, and so the, the autoclave requirements Nothing living should go in or out of that lab. And so there's pass-throughs that are autoclaves. So if you're going to put equipment in there um, to prevent contamination, basically you sterilize it going in. And then if anything comes out, it's sterilized in autoclave by heat and steam. Uh, but also uh, coming out, personnel have to be, have to be washed. And so these uh, biosafety lab, the PPE in level four is full body air supplied positive pressure suits. And so that's what you see with these little, um, they call them bunny suits, um, double gloved, gloves taped on or sealed in some way. I mean, there's no break in the, in the protection there. And these suits, when you come out of this, I, I worked in hazmat uh, training, not in biosafety lab training, but when you come out of a contamination area, you go through decontamination. And in, in an outdoor area, it's three levels of decontamination. So you have your regular clothing, like workout clothes. Then you put on a level B suit, which is like a Tigon tubing suit for splash protection. You have a set of gloves. You, know, you have a little hat, you know, and everything, safety glasses. And then they put the level A suit on top of that, which has your air supply. And it's a positive pressure suit. So even if you get a pinhole, it's blowing out the pinhole. Nothing's coming in. But you get chemicals on you, and in this case, you may get pathogens on you. So when you come out, you're decontaminated. 
So in an outdoor situation, you're stepping in a little swimming pool and they spray you down with bleach water, okay, which is going to oxidize any of these pathogens. You know, it's nerve gas, blister agents, all of those things are going to be destroyed by bleach, okay? So they bleach you down, they bleach that suit. Then you step into the next swimming pool, you take that suit off and it goes in the, you know, the, the waste disposal bin, pack drum, and then you've got your level B suit on. And either they spray that, that's, you know, it's also, it's open, your face is open, so they don't necessarily drench you with that, but they, they do a decontamination step on the level B suit, then you take that off, and that goes in the storage or the, the waste disposal bin, and then you step into the third one, and they basically inspect you and, you know, make sure there's nothing on you, and then you're free to go. Same thing kind of happens here, coming out, these suits are going to be decontaminated, they're going to be removed, they're going to go into some sort of bin, then you're going to go into the next level and remove that clothing. So these are the things that have to be done to keep the viruses or whatever it is in the biosafety area from getting out. Okay, so parting thoughts are just that, you know, pilot describes flying as hours of boredom interrupted by seconds of terror. And the, and the successful landing is one you can walk away from. So forensic science, we've, we've been in the terrorist era since 9-11, at least our, our, maybe longer, but our consciousness has been uh, changed since 9-11. And so hopefully we'll have years of boredom and interrupted by days of terror. And your job is to stop those days of terror. You know, if you're on the, on the security side of things, on the front end of things, you're looking for ways to detect, disrupt, destroy those threats which are intents and capabilities so that we won't have those days of terror. So here's some of the sources for this work was Smith's detection. It was a web, weapons of mass destruction class taught several years ago by Mark Miller. And then the chemistry explosives book uh, on the sensitivity of explosives and also explosives engineering by Cooper. So, anything that you're interested in or 